Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter, and thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great day. We're going to celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. We had Good Friday services where we remembered what he did for us and how God sent him because he loves us so much and how he died on the cross to take our sin and shame with him to the cross. But today came, and we celebrate the fact that he is risen and he is here today. So we're going to worship him. We're going to shout for joy in the fact that he is God and that he is here. So I want to encourage you to sing loud. And um, let's stand together and let's worship our God. Greatest day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. At last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Endless joy, perfect peace, earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive.
your voices, lift your eyes. We're gonna shout, we're gonna shake the skies. Cause God is alive. We've been redeemed. So rise and sing. Everyone glorify the risen sun. The Holy One has overcome. Jesus is alive. in victory Jesus is alive oh Jesus is alive the empty grave is singing now it's shouting out he is alive he is alive and we are free the empty grave is singing now shouting out he is alive he is alive and we are free we've been redeemed so rise and say everyone glorify the risen son the holy one has overcome jesus is alive Amen. Jesus is alive. You know, the Bible says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that is why Jesus died for us. He took our sin on the cross with him. All because that God wants to have a relationship with you. He sent his only son into the world so that when we believe in him, we will be saved. And that's just the reason why Jesus was buried. He took our sin and our shame to the grave but today we celebrate the fact that he is alive and we can be alive in Christ when we accept him today on this wonderful wonderful glorious day I was buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. And all my failures I tried to hide. Oh, it was my tomb. Till I met you And you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your saved my soul and now your freedom is all that I know all the old made new Jesus when I met you and you called my
needed rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now your love is the air that i'm breathing i am the future my eyes are open because when you call seated. What is the most iconic symbol of Christianity? Is it a trophy? Is it a sword? Is it a crown? How about a finger raised and the chant, we're number one? No, it's something that looks and feels a little more like defeat. The cross is the most popular symbol of Christianity. We see them in churches and on buildings. We wear them as jewelry. The cross symbolizes the single most important event in all of history. The cross is also a way of life, a better way of life. The cross is where Jesus died and where we come alive. What would it look like for you and I to not only believe in the cross, but to actually live the cross? Good morning. I want to welcome you, all of you who are here at our Dodgeville campus. I want to welcome our Ritson Center family. And those of you who are watching online, um, we really are glad that you're with us. I just want to say Happy Easter to all of you. Happy Resurrection Sunday, whatever you call this day. It's a fantastic day. Um, my name is Scott. For those of you who may be new, um, I'm on staff here. Um, and, and on behalf of the staff, I just want to thank you for being with us. It's, it's a privilege um, that in the midst of a holiday, and we all have busy schedules on holidays, that you would be willing to come out and be with us. Um, we don't take that lightly. We're really thankful that you are with us. I do, um, I want to publicly thank, um, you know, we had a couple extra services. We had a Good Friday service, this service, and we had a meal beforehand here in Dodgeville. And I want to thank all the volunteers for the different things that you did. I'm not going to name names because the minute you name one, you forget another. Um, but I don't want to do that. Um, but for the, all of you, who, the roles you played in Good Friday, the role that you played this morning, including making roles, some of you, um, thank you. Um, Hidden Valley, you know, really exists because people serve and use their talents. And those talents include things like, you know, greeting people at the door or cooking a fantastic egg dish or whatever it is. Um, that's what makes a church a church. Um, it's not a, one individual it's not somebody who's got a, you know, a visible talent. It's people just serving and using their gifts to glorify Jesus. Um, and the reason we had those different things this week is because Easter's different. I mean, let's be honest. It's, it's different. And it, it may be more different than any other holiday when you think about it. You know, there's this pastor. His name is David Platt. He's an author, and he, he pastors a pretty large church in America. And in, in one of the um, openings of the book he wrote several years ago, he was talking about um, Easter. And he was talking about the Easter preparations at his church. And like I said, this was several years ago. And it was a couple days before Easter, and he was, he was standing on the stage. And he looked around, and he saw, you know, the, the little drive that they had that they put in so that at the right time, the stone that they had erected in front of the tomb would roll away. And he saw the smoke machines that were, that were timed, so right when that tomb opened, the smoke would rise and it would fill the whole stage and kind of waft out into the crowd. He saw the harness that was going to be attached to the person playing Jesus, and Jesus would rise and kind of go out over the crowd. 
I tried to get our leadership to buy one for me, but they wouldn't do it. <laughs> Actually, I'm afraid of heights. Don't want to do it. Um, he saw all the, they had extra lights on the stage that would like fill the whole room with lights at that you know, moment when the tomb opened. They'd spent a lot of money. David Platt, even in the book, he even talks about, we spent about the same amount on, the, on all those little details for Easter as if we'd hired another staff person. And then this is what David Platt thought, and he wrote this in his book. Standing there in silence, is this really what Easter is all about? Is it the harness? Is it the smoke machine? Is it that rock that we've got mechanically that's going to move? Is it the lights? What's Easter all about? I mean, just think about it, for example. Is Easter really a holiday? I mean, if you go to church, churches, they, they talk about a holy week. It's not just a day. It's kind of like eight days, you know. And, and during that holy week, everything's got a name. Last Sunday was Palm Sunday. Did you know there's a holy Monday, holy Tuesday? Here's my favorite, Spy Wednesday. We've got to celebrate Spy Wednesday next week or next year. There's Maundy Thursday, there's Good Friday, there's Silent Saturday, and there's this day. And depending on who you are, depending where you are, you either call it Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. This holiday, is it really a day? It seems more like an event. And think about all the images that, that kind of surround this holiday. We decorate eggs I just want to eat them. You know, we decorate eggs. We have baskets. When I was growing up, there was a rabbit, like a six-foot-tall rabbit that would show up at our house. And I felt bad for that rabbit growing up. I really, really did, because here's what happened at my house. Every year, the rabbit would show up. He'd leave us baskets. And that poor guy, when he left our house... There was a trail of, of chocolates leading from our walkway to the road. And you know what we were told? I mean, this is sad. It's because he had a hole in his pocket. And nobody ever got him a new jacket. So if you'd like to contribute to his new jacket, you know, talk to me afterwards, and I'll make sure it gets to the right person. We eat ham. You know what Jesus never ate? Ham. And here's one. I, I tried to figure this one out, and I still don't know the answer. You know what else we eat on Easter Sunday? Some of you are going to eat deviled eggs. I don't know why we do that, but they are good. Actually, in the South, I found that this out. In the South, they don't call them deviled eggs. They're stuffed eggs. Maybe we should change the name. But we eat deviled eggs on Easter Sunday. We, we have filled plastic eggs. We have an empty tomb. We have palm branches. We have folded death linens. And some of us wear new clothes on Easter. What's it all about? Seriously, what is Easter all about? There's all these images and all this. What, what's it all about? I mean, even here at Dodgeville, you know what Easter was, was in part about this morning? This long table filled with really, really good stuff, and I ate some, and I'd really like to take a nap right now. What's Easter all about? So here's what we're going to do today. We're, we're going to put the plastic eggs behind. And you can open them later today. There's nothing wrong with that. And you can eat deviled eggs later on today. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but there's ten words 
that kind of tell us what Easter is about. And here's the goal. We're going to look at those 10 words, and hopefully it'll give us something to hold on to. What is this thing called Easter really all about? And we have the kids with us today because we like to do that on holidays. And kids, you play a very important role because I know your mom and dad. They're not going to do what I'm about to say. It's your job to make sure they do. So kids, model this for mom and dad. Put your hand up and just put one hand up in the air like this. Five fingers out. Because here's the first five words that Easter is about. Christ died for our sins. Five words. We're starting with the first five. Christ died for our sins. And actually, those five words, they're found in a Bible verse in, in 1 Corinthians 15.3. And here, here's what that whole verse says. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture. And I want you to notice something about that verse. Um, the writer Paul, he says, this is the first, most important thing. You need to know this one. Of all the things that we could talk about at Easter, this is really the most important thing you need to know. It's five words. Christ died for our sins. And each of those words, they really, really matter. The first one, that idea of Christ, here's what we need to understand, and maybe some of us don't know this. Um, but here's the reality. Christ was not Jesus' last name. Maybe some of us, you know, and, and it, it kind of makes sense. He's called Jesus Christ a lot. Maybe his parents were, you know, Joseph and Mary Christ. Just like you're so-and-so Smith or so-and-so Williams or Jones or whatever your last name is. But Christ was not Jesus' last name. So what, what, is, what does that Christ thing actually mean? So Christ is, a, is the Greek word, but the Hebrew equivalent is the word Messiah. And in the Old Testament, God had promised he was going to send somebody called the Messiah, the Christ. And there's all kinds of amazing promises. This Messiah was going to be a king, but not just a king of, you know, a nation here or a nation. He was going to be the king over all the nations. And, and his rulership was going to be, you know, characterized by things like peace and justice and mercy and kindness And literally for thousands of years, people were waiting for that guy to show up. And you know what else? There were some little hints in the Old Testament, just kind of suggestions, hints, that maybe this Messiah was going to suffer. Maybe he was going to die. But you know what? Over time, they were so excited about the good stuff that he was going to do, they kind of overlooked those, those little other hints. And you know what? We all want a king who's going to offer us justice and kindness and mercy. And maybe we don't want to hear about the fact that he had to suffer. He had to die. So that term Christ, that term Messiah, it's not a last name. It's a promise. God is going to send somebody who's going to do amazing things. He's going to rule the whole world with justice and kindness. But then there's those other things. And it's easy to overlook them. Because let's be honest, we like to hear the positive, but the negative, if we could just forget about that part. But here's the second reality in that sentence, that Christ died. Jesus, the Christ, he died. 
Now just let that sink in for a moment. I know most of us here and, and watching, most of us, we've heard that before. But this is the Messiah. The one that we are told is going to rule everything and everywhere forever. That guy can't die. I mean, it, you can't do all those things that are, uh, that are promised in the Old Testament. You can't do them if you die. But that was part of the promise. In fact, 700 plus years before Jesus had come to earth, in Isaiah 53, this is what we're told about Jesus. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We like the good news. You know, there's lots of good news at Easter. We're going to eat a great meal. That's good news. Some of us got Easter baskets. That's good news. When I was growing up, it was good news that the, that poor rabbit was too poor to buy a new coat. And you know what? I don't want to brag, but I was the oldest kid. So I, the first place I would go was outside to get that stuff. And my younger brother and sister never picked up on it. It's good news. But there is a negative side to this story. That Messiah, that Christ, the one who had the title Christ, he died. And naturally, we're supposed to ask why. Because that's what we do when somebody dies. You know, sometimes, you know, they're at the doctor's office and we get the news and we know why and we know what. But, but that's what we do that. We ask why. What did he do wrong? What, 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 what did he, do? you know, why? Here's something really amazing. Jesus the Christ died, but he had done nothing wrong. And just think about that. This is the most, one of the most astounding things about Jesus. He lived approximately 33 years. He never did anything wrong. I am so glad I was not his younger brother. Can you imagine being the younger brother to somebody who never did anything wrong? It's not easy. Ask my brother and sister. <laughs> you know... You and I, we tend to categorize two people into really, and we may not say this out loud, but let's be honest, we do it. There's kind of two categories we put people in. We consider people either good or bad, right? You know, if during football season, if you wear purple, you're good. If you wear green, no problem. <laughs> For those of you who might be new, God blessed me because I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan. But we do that, right? We all have different categories, but some people are good and some people are bad. You know, Jesus was a whole different category. And nobody fits in this one. He was perfect. Perfect. There's three categories of people. There's you and I. And we're in good or bad, or maybe we switch from time to time. And then there's Jesus. Perfect. End of discussion. I mean, look, look at what 1 Peter 2 says about him. He committed, this is Jesus, committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. He never even spoke something hurtful to somebody. Not once. 
Not once did he say words that hurt him, that put her down. He didn't gossip about that one or this. Never once. So why did this Jesus die? Because people in that culture, you didn't go to the cross by accident. It wasn't one of those deals where, you, you know, you got a speeding ticket and off to the cross you go. You'd had to have a lifetime of faults to go to the cross. Well, that's, you know what? It's Christ died. Here's the reason why he died for our sins. And here's what's really great news before we talk about what that word sin means. Um, it doesn't say that he died for a few sins. It doesn't say that he died for the not so bad sins. It doesn't say he died for just his sins. It doesn't say he died for just her sins. It just says he died for sins. And sin's one of those words, nowhere else do you ever hear that word except in church. And so some of us, maybe we have a misunderstanding about what that word is. Um, but the word really simply means this. It means we have missed the goal. We've missed the mark. It's, it's kind of pretty clear in Romans 3.23. It says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We miss We've missed. Sin doesn't mean, you know, one of those mistakes, oops, I dropped it. Sin is more than, you know, just kind of, oh, I didn't know. It means we've missed. And here's the truth. We have all missed. Which means we've all sinned. And maybe you grew up in church, or maybe you've heard this, that you are horrible because you've sinned, and you're just the worst thing because you've sinned, and you've done all these horrible things. It just means this, you've missed, and I've missed. And there aren't degrees of this sin is this, or that sin. We've missed. doesn't make you the worst person. It doesn't make you worse than her. It doesn't make you worse than him. Doesn't We've missed. So I want to tell you something. This is kind of bragging, and you should clap after I tell you this. Most of you know I, I played basketball. I played a lot of basketball. Um, and I wasn't very good. But you know what I do well on a basketball court? I, I don't miss free throws. You know, I once made 49 free throws in a row. <laughs> you know what that means happened on number 50? I missed. You know what the all, and if I sound jealous, and I know it's Easter and I shouldn't do this, but if I sound jealous, yeah, I'm jealous of this guy. You know what the all-time record for most free throws made in a row is? It's 5,221, which makes 49 sound pathetic. And it, was written, and it was done by this guy. He was 66 years old. Yeah, I'm jealous. But you know what happened on shot number 5,222 for Ted St. Martin? He missed. You know what sin means? It means that you and I can do a lot of good things. We can say a lot of good things. We can help a lot of people. We can sacrifice a lot. We can, but we miss. We've all missed. We can go, not that this probably has ever happened, we can go 5,221 days without missing, but then we miss. You know what this holiday is about? It's about a Christ, the Messiah, this one who was promised. He came to earth. He died for our sins because we have all missed. I didn't say you're bad all the time. I didn't say you've done the worst, part, but you have missed. I have missed. 
And you know what's really good news? That's just the first five words. And these next five words, we're going to have to kind of unpack them because at first you're going to say, well, what? I don't understand. What does that mean? What's, uh, it's, well, that's kind of strange. But here's the next five words. Kids, I need your help because mom and dad aren't going to do this. Here's the next five words. Death. Where is your sting? And in a few moments, we'll actually put this, these words in context because they're found in the Bible. But if you look at those words, death, where is your sting? It's almost like Paul is writing to death and he's kind of mocking death. Hey, dude, death, where's your sting? It's kind of like he's mocking. But before we look at that verse, I kind of sometimes have trouble with these words. Because I wonder, is it true? Death, where is your sting? And you know what most of us answer? I I know how death stings. So I started working on this message a few weeks ago. And some of you know this. But less than two weeks ago, my 18-year-old nephew passed away. And I got to tell you, it still stings. And I'm not his mom, my sister. Death stings. It hurts. I mean, on Good Friday, when I stood here talking about Jesus' death, My nephew's death, it kind of stung. It really hurt. And Paul says, death, where's your sting? And you know, there's this amazing passage in the Bible where Jesus, he goes to the tomb where his friend Lazarus had died and, and Lazarus was in the tomb. And there's this amazing verse in the Bible It's the shortest verse, but it's not trivial. Jesus, it says this about Jesus in John 11, 35. Jesus wept. Apparently, apparently death stung Jesus. And the amazing thing is Jesus cried when somebody died. And you know what he did literally like three or four minutes after that? He brought that man back to life. But death stung It hurt. I'm not sure any of us would necessarily agree with Paul. Yeah, I I, I don't think death stings. And I was at a funeral for an awesome 18-year-old kid last Saturday, and it was full of people who stung It hurt. So is it true? Death, where's your sting? Because it doesn't feel that way for most of us. You know what it really means? And this is good news. Death doesn't win. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Death doesn't win. Because here's the context of those words. Death, where is your sting? This is once again Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 15. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You know where sting or are where death stings right here on earth. It hurts. I've cried for two straight weeks. It hurts. But you know who it doesn't hurt for? The sting doesn't last. Because my nephew Spencer is with Jesus. It stings here. It stings a lot. 
But for the person who knows Jesus, death doesn't sting anymore. You know, nobody who knows Jesus, nobody who opens their eyes for the first time in heaven, ever does this. Well, I expect it to be a little better than this. Nobody who ever, when the first time they step into heaven, nobody looks around and says, is this it? I was kind of hoping for a little, where are the harnesses? Where's the lights? Where's the smoke machine? Nobody ever walks into heaven and there's a sting. You know, the amazing thing is sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll talk about heaven and people ask me as a pastor about heaven sometimes and there's questions, you know. Um, people will ask me, what are we going to look like in heaven? And I give the very profound answer, I don't know. What are we going to do in heaven? And, and once again, out of my great wisdom, I don't know. Are we going to are we going to this? You know, I don't know. Is my favorite cat Fufu going to be there? No, cats are not going to be in heaven. I'm kidding. <laughs> you know what the Bible does make pretty clear to us? It really, you know, it, it doesn't talk to us about heaven as much as maybe we'd like. But there's two really important things that the Bible says about heaven. First one, it's this. It says, who will be in heaven and just as important is what won't be in heaven. And before we look at the verse, just so you know, this is what I used to think heaven was like. I used to think heaven was, you know, you get there and you do what you enjoy. So for eternity, I would be playing basketball and I would shoot free throws better than Ted St. Martin. I mean, I used to think kind of that's what heaven is, is you go there and you do the thing that you love the most and you're the best at it. So we would play one-on-one -on -one in basketball. Neither of us would miss a shot. And that would be kind of boring. Used to kind of think that. The Bible doesn't tell us nearly as much as we'd like to know about heaven. But it tells us who's there. And it actually tells us what won't be in heaven. Look at Revelation 21. This is a scene from heaven. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And here's what won't be in heaven. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You'll never have another lump in your throat that if you open your mouth and speak, you'll just start crying. Death shall be no more. Death dies. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain. Emotional, spiritual, physical, mental pain of any kind for the former things have passed away you know why what, what paul means when he says death where is your sting it's not in heaven there's sting here it's not in heaven there's no sting for people who know Jesus. So here's 10 words to hold on to. To hold on to as we celebrate Easter, but really, there's, these are 10 words we ought to hold on to every single day of our lives. Christ died for our sins, which means death where is your sting? Those are 10 things to hang on to. And, and how did the Christ, I mean, we should ask this, how did he do that for us? Because, and I dropped this, 
Because we've all sinned, and that means in some ways, our life, this is written on our lives. Because we've all missed. Doesn't mean you've done the worst possible sin ever. Doesn't mean that yours are less or more than his or hers. We don't have to compare. But this is what it means. That there's something written on our lives called sin. But you know what? Just like this whiteboard, sin is not written in permanent ink. Because Jesus came to earth. The Christ came to earth. And he died for our sins. And this didn't get nearly as clean as I expected it to. (laughs) But you know what your life can look like if you believe in Jesus? He looks at your life as if you didn't sin. And some of us, you know, some, maybe you committed one of those sins where you think that's the, that's the bad one. I crossed, you know, I crossed the line. No sins are written in permanent ink. I went too f- far. I, I did, you, you don't understand, Scott. I did something. I don't even want to say it out loud. No sins written in permanent ink. 2 Corinthians, that same author, Paul, because he really believed a lot about what Jesus did. But this is what he says in in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin. He made Jesus to be sin. He died for our sin. Who knew no sin, he never sinned. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Christ died for our sins. Death, where is your sting? Those are the things we really need to hold on to. Easter is ultimately about Jesus who died for our sins. And then when he rose again, death lost. Death died. There's actually, you know, you could take those 10 words and really there's only one word that kind of like encapsulate what that story really is about. And that one word would be this, extraordinary. It's extraordinary that God would do that for us. You know, some of us, we've heard this story so many times and and nothing I've said today is new to probably a lot of us, but it's extraordinary that God would do that for us. And that word extraordinary, that applies to who God is. He's extraordinary. And here's what we're going to st- do starting next Sunday. And, and if you're visiting us and you don't have a home church, we would absolutely love to have you come back. But next Sunday, we're going to start a, a series of messages. And th- it's called this, Extraordinary God. And here's what we're going to do over the next several weeks. We're going to look at the fact there's an extraordinary God who wants to have a relationship with a very ordinary me and a very ordinary you. And, and how, how, can I, how can I connect with this extraordinary God? And so we're just going to look at some of the habits and the practices that God actually gives us. How do I do that? And there's nothing that's crazy. It's really simple stuff. But how, do, how, do, how does ordinary me connect with an extraordinary God. And we would absolutely love to have you be a part of that over the next several weeks. I don't promise you breakfast, but we're going to look at how we can connect with this God. And then we're going to do something else starting April 23rd, and and we'll we'll cover this in the announcements as well. Um, But we're just going to have a brief three-week kind of look at what God's story is. And when I say God's story, we're kind of talking about this book. Lots of pages in here, lots of stories. And, and sometimes you think the stories are off on a tangent. and you, It's like, when are we going to get what's going on here? Um, but there's really, there's six words. I'm, I'm into numbers of words today, aren't I, for some reason? But there's six words 
that kind of help us understand the story of this book. And it's going to be three weeks long. And like I said, it won't start till April 23rd, but you can kind of put on your um, information card today that you're interested and we'll get into it. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at those six words, how they kind of help us understand the Bible. This, this is for people who don't know anything about the Bible, people who know something about the Bible, people who want to know more about the Bible. It's just to help us to understand this big story that this extraordinary God is writing in our lives. So I want to end with a saying that a lot of us have heard. You've probably, you've probably heard this, and there's even a song that, that kind of refers to these lyrics. But you know what a picture paints, right? A thousand words. I found a picture this week that paints not a thousand words. It paints ten words. Here's the picture. Christ died for our sins. Death, where is your sting? You know, it's amazing. If you've never said these words to God, Jesus died for my sins, that's our response. That's the proper response. And as we close, um, that's the response that we ought to make. I believe Jesus died for my sins. And that means that someday you open your eyes and you say, Death, where is your sting? Not here on earth, because it still stings. But someday, that's what we get to say. Let's pray. God, I thank you for Easter. It is bigger than a holiday. It's more than a holiday. Um, but it is about 10 words. Christ died for our sins. Your promised Messiah came to earth and died for our sins. And God, I pray if there's somebody watching, somebody here in Dodgeville who's never said these words, but maybe today they believe them for the first time, they'd simply say this, God, I believe you sent Jesus. He died for my sins. Um, and I want to wake up someday and find out that the sting of death is only a thing that happens on earth. God, I thank you for each person here. Um, Jesus was thinking of us when he died in our place. Thank you for Jesus. In his name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. And before we leave today, we have a few announcements. Um, first of all, tomorrow night, Monday night, is our Power of Prayer meeting. It starts at 6 o'clock. And um, prayer is just basically talking to God. You can do that anytime, anywhere. You can do it in your car. You can do it anywhere. It's just talking to God. You don't have to have specific words. It's just your heart. Just saying, God, I need you. And um, it's a two-way relationship. Giving our attention to God, but also listening to what he wants to say to us. And that, that takes some time. That takes some discipline. Because we have so many things in this world that we just need to, you know, ask God for help with. But there's also a time to be still and know that he is God. And when we come to pray, um, we pray for our church, we pray for the community, we pray for each other. And um, it's just a great time of encouragement. It's a great time to just come and talk to God. So we want to invite you to come um, tomorrow night. Anyone can come. And uh, so come and pray. Enjoy fellowship and encourage one, one another and and let's watch God move. On Saturday, April 13th, we will be hosting a one-day women's conference called the IF Gathering. The conference is going to start at 9 o'clock, and it'll end approximately about 3. And there will be various speakers um, that will be sharing their faith. And um, it'll be a day of encouragement, real relationships about life, and some of the chaos that we go through as women. Um, and um, God cares about all that, and he cares about you. So we want to encourage you ladies to come. There will be a continental breakfast, and a lunch will be provided. So if you are coming, please let us know um, to sign up on your, I don't have it with me, but uh, there should be some information, there should be a link in your announcements to tell you where to go to sign up for that. So um, we hope you, that you will join us on that. Again, that's on Saturday, April 13th. 
Um, Scott kind of touched on this one a little bit on the 23rd, which is a Tuesday. Um, we are going to have a, a Bible study class called Creation to Come Back. And um, this is for anyone, as he had mentioned, who, who wants to know what the Bible is all, all about. You want to know more about the Bible and what God is all about. There's a lot to be said about this God that we worship here today. You'll learn all that God has done and um, what he has done just because he wants to have a relationship with you. And that's really important. So we hope you'll join us. And again, you can please sign up by emailing Pastor Scott, either at scott at hiddenv.com, or just let us know on the connection card that you're interested in that Bible study. And someone will be in contact with you. Um, the rest of the announcements are in your program. You do have this connections card. We do ask that you fill that out and let us know that you were here. Um, this, if this is your first time visiting, first of all, we want to thank you so much for um, joining us on this special day. And um, let us know that you're here. We have a little gift that we want to send you. There's also some more information. We have a newsletter that you can sign up for so you can find out what's happening here at Hidden Valley. We do a lot of outreach, um, and that's very important to us for our community. So please let us know that you're here. And uh, there's a comment on there about the takeaway from today's message. If there was something that kind of hit you today that you've never thought of before and what you heard, let us know. We love to hear from you. You're really important to us. Um, we would like to ask for some help with the chairs. This is, we haven't had this many chairs set up in a long time, so a lot of hands make light work. So if you could help us, what we do is we stack them eight high, and the legs have to line up. And then we have some dollies over here, or we have them somewhere, and um, we will move the chairs to the sides of the auditorium. We do have a lot of groups in the community that come in. They utilize this gym, and uh, we want to be able to serve them in that way. So if you could help us, we would deeply appreciate that. Um, Pastor Scott will be down front if you have any questions or if you would like him to pray with you. Um, my name is Terry, and I'm on the leadership team. And I think we're going to look into that harness for you <laughs> for next year. Um, so on behalf of all the staff, all the volunteers that we have here at Hidden Valley, we want to thank you for giving Hidden Valley a try today. And it's our hope and prayer that God touched you some way through this service and that you can go out and continue your faith walk with him. Um, if you have a few moments, say hi to a couple people before you leave. Um, thanks so much for coming, and we'll hope to see you next week.